from Martinsville Speedway, Motor Racing Network presents the $140,000 Virginia 500. At the Martinsville Speedway, I'm Mike Joy for the $140,000 Virginia 500. For those of you accustomed to the 200 mile an hour wheel to wheel racing action at Daytona and Talladega, this is really different. On this half mile racetrack, you'll see some of the most brutal, fender flailing, leaning on each other racing to be witnessed anywhere on the 31 race, $6 million Grand National Tour. This Martinsville track is two long straightaways that require tremendous horsepower and torque. The Martinsville Corners put more stress on brakes than anywhere in NASCAR oval racing. It's a track where the drivers truly crowd each other and their luck on every lap. Covering the action on pit road for Motor Racing Network today is two-time NASCAR Grand National Champion, Ned Jarrett. Mike, the weather here today is one factor. We've had some showers this morning and more predicted for this afternoon, but the big story today is the new tire rule that goes into effect. The drivers will be seeing this flag for the very first time. It will be displayed at the end of pit road when a caution is flown on the racetrack. And if the drivers come in and change tires when this flag is being displayed, they are automatically assessed a two-lap penalty. Now, like all other new rules, there's some controversy, and we've talked to some of the key figures about their feeling of this new tire rule. James Hilton, what is your opinion of the tire rule? Well, just for briefly, I love it. It's, uh, it's the best thing NASCAR has done in years. Will it take away from the competition? Well, Ned, I think it's going to make competition just as good. Uh, it's going to help the, all the teams get a better pit crew and uh, make their pit crews work harder under the green flag from changing, you know, and all this. So I think it's all the way around. It's going to make a better show all the way around as it goes. Darrell Walter, what is your opinion of the new tire rule? Well... You know, a person uh, probably should wait till after the race to pass judgment on the thing, but I happen to believe it, it's, it's going to be a fiasco. I think it's a really big mistake for a lot of reasons, but mainly because I don't think the fans in the stand came to see a race that's determined by something that happens in the pit, uh, particularly something that you have no control over. Well, the jury is out. We expect a decision to be rendered after 500 laps of racing here, and Mike, it's going to be interesting to say the least. Rain has been falling most of the morning here at Martinsville as you see tires being mounted for the Virginia 500 competition. Tires come into play in several ways here at Martinsville. They take old truck tires and drag them along the racetrack to help dry it, as the field will move out shortly for several preliminary laps. The 25th annual Virginia 500, brought to you by Bush Beer. Don't just reach for a beer, head for the mountains. And by STP, makers of fine automotive products. And by Dodge Cars and Trucks. Test drive total performance by Dodge. And by Peak Antifreeze and Coolant, the Grand National Coolant. At Martinsville, Virginia, for the Virginia 500, the covers are coming off the race cars. The rain has stopped and the track is in the process of being dried. These cars will take several laps prior to getting started with the actual competition. Drivers getting strapped in and adjusted. You see Buddy Baker settling into his Chevrolet. Let's take a look at the starting lineup. In row number 16, Baxter Price and Jimmy Means. In the 15th row, Bobby Waywack and Tommy Gale. Row number 14, Slick Johnson will be starting inside of Junior Miller, two rookie contenders. In row 13, hometown veteran Buddy Arrington, along with Dick May. In the 12th row, Richard Childress with Cecil Gordon, two veteran independent drivers. In row 11, former rookie of the year Ronnie Thomas with up-and-comer Rick Newsom. Row number 10, J.D. McDuffie, along with Buck Simmons. The cars move down pit road on the first of several preliminary laps. Let's continue with the starting lineup. In row number nine, rookie point leader Jody Ridley starts alongside of D.K. Ulrich. In the eighth row, two rookies, Kyle Petty, third generation driver, and Bill Ellswick. In row seven, James Hilton starting outside of Terry Labonte. 
In the sixth row, the point standing leader, Dale Earnhardt, starts on the inside of hard charging independent Dave Marcus. In row five, Dick Brooks is outside of Harry Gant. Gant hurt in a 160 mile an hour practice crash at Charlotte. How does he feel? Well, we got uh, a brace in the seat, and I got a, a cast of the wear on the side. And, uh, you know, we got a lot of padding and seating on the way. Well, I got the seat set in the car, and we've got the car where to steer easier, which helps a whole lot. Inside row four is Joe Milliken, and outside row four, we asked Richard Petty, do you bump and bang a lot here? Well, that's going what circumstances are. Uh, you know, from time to time, you have to move them around a little bit to, to make sure they do know you there and to make sure that you get by. But uh, other times you hit them, uh, and you don't really mean to because they, they're having to slow up for some traffic or something that you don't see, and you run into them. So uh, it's just a very close deal. you got 30 cars on a half-mile track, and, you know, they're running uh, 90 or 100 mile an hour at the end of the straightaway, and gets awful close. Neil Bonnet starts outside of three-time champ Cale Yarborough in row number three. In the second row, Bobby Allison's Ford is outside the Chevrolet of Benny Parsons. And in the front row, hard-charging Buddy Baker starts outside of Bull Sitter at 88.6 miles an hour, outspoken Darrell Waltrip. One lap to go before we go racing, and we talked to the front row starters earlier about their strategy when the green flag drops. Buddy Baker? I'm in a bad spot here. You can't run on the outside of this racetrack, and... Uh... If you'll jump early and I can get in second, I'll be satisfied for a while there because it's tough on the brakes right at first. So. What do you think we ought to do, start on the back chute somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> you usually do. I don't know why it changed now. Drivers bobbing and weaving, making sure that track is dry and tires are up to race temperature. They're in that back stretch, waiting for the green flag to drop on the first of 500 laps. And Mike, this is one of the most anxious moments in the race for the drivers as they get ready to take that green flag, each wanting to beat the other one into that first turn. We'll see if Baker can dive into that second spot as he had hoped. The fast way around Martinsville is on the inside. Green flag is falling. Waltra beats Baker into the first turn and he cuts inside, cutting off Benny Parsons who lies third. Out of turn two, but trouble in the first turn. As Dale Earnhardt and Dick Brooks tangle, J.D. McDuffie rolls to the inside to miss them, and the rest of the field scrambles by. It looks like rush hour on the freeway. As all piled up, there's Harry Gant and James Hilton, who look to have gotten the worst of this nine-car pileup on the opening green flag. Gant struggles to move his car. Remember, he is driving injured with his ribs all taped up, and he looked to take quite a lick at that one, Ned. Yes, he did, Mike. Let's hope that he is not injured. It looks like he is going to be able to get his car away. There's Richard Petty. He also was involved. A lot of sheet metal damage done to the left side of his car. Smoke coming from the left rear. Left rear tire smoke on Petty's car. He's pitted on the front stretch. He'll have to come all the way around. And remember, you can't change tires on the yellow. Well, here's Hilton getting his car to going, and the way that car is banged up, Mike, it's a miracle it will move. It looks like a refugee from Demolition Derby, Ned, rather than a Grand National stock car race. Look at the bumpers about to fall off as Hilton limps his car onto pit road. Looks like a New York taxi cab. <laughs> yes, it does. And here's the leader, Darrell Waltrip, still going around under the caution. And Waltrip, remember, started on the pole and was well out ahead of the accident. Gant's car still being administered to by the wreckers. It looks like they're going to have to take two wreckers, maybe, to get him into the pits. They'll have to pick it up hammock style. Quite a shot he took. A tough break for a driver who has really been running strong recently. It looks like that car might be finished for the day, Mike. Let's take a look at how it started. Here's Earnhardt with his left wheels down on the grass. He gets into Richard Petty, turns Petty crossways, then Dick Brooks gets hit, and everybody then starts piling into them with nowhere to go. There's Harry Gant's car near the top of your screen. He gets hit from all sides. Terry Labonte, James Hilton, Bill Ellswick and Kyle Petty all look to get a piece of the number 47 car. Well, finally, they've got Gant's car on the wreck right. Here's the flag that is used when they cannot change tires, but they can do other work in the pits when this flag is displayed. Here's Dale Earnhardt in the pits getting repairs on his car, and that wonderful duct tape comes to good use here again as they try to tape the thing back together so they get him back in the action. Cale Yarbrough looked like he got a piece of it. There's some of that silver tape holding together the front end of his Chevrolet. And look at the damage to Dick Brooks' car. Are you going to be able to get back in? Yeah, I think so. He hit me in the left rear and busted a brake drum, I think, and I mean, uh, rotors. So I think they're going to fix that. Of course, Mike, that was Dick Brooks. You can see there's a lot of damage done to this car. 
That car looks like it got into a schoolyard scrap and lost. They're fitting a left rear fender to Brooks' car. That'll cost him two laps in addition to the time he lost. And here's Richard Petty's banged up car. And moments ago, Mike, these were brand new automobiles. Martinsville Speedway is a body man's nightmare for just this kind of reason. Here's the rookie, Bill Ellswick, waiting to go back out. The pit board being shown to Richard Petty. They're trying to get him back in the pits. And Bill. here he is for more repair. And here's Harry Gant's car. They're going to work on that Take thing, trying to get it back in the race. Take the mic. Harry, what happened over there? Well, Earnhardt and Brooks got together going in, and one of them hit Petty, and he turned around, and I backed off, and I got hit in the back and jammed into him. Well, he certainly did that, Mike, as we can see. Are you okay? I don't really know. I can't tell. If it's not any lines broke or anything, I think we'll be okay. I'm not sure. Hit pretty hard. Well, he was just in an accident a couple of weeks ago. He's staying in the car, hoping they'll get it ready to go again, Mike. I thought you were asking him about his condition. He talked about the race car, so Harry Gant must be fine. There's Bob Johnson and Steve Bird trying to get the left front of that car fixed as Cale Yarbrough and Richard Petty exit pit road. And they've made several stops, and neither of them have lost a lap making those repairs on their cars. A lap at Martinsville is really tough to make up. Yes, it is very tough because the passing is so tough here. Long straightaways and tight turns characterize this half-mile racetrack. Once again, here's the Jack Beebe crew. They've got everybody into the act. I can't believe they're going to get this car back in the race now. It'll be a miracle if they do, Mike, but these fellows perform miracles. There's Jack Beebe, the owner of the car, coming into the action. Everybody lends a hand, and nobody looks too pleased. He's going to be looking at a different side if he gets back on the racetrack, looking how he'll have no hood or fenders. James Hilton didn't fare much better. There's a lot of tape holding his car together. I don't, I don't see much of a bumper or fender there, do you, Ned? Not very much, and it looks like most of it was sheet metal damage, though, and we're getting ready, I believe, to start this race again. And there is Darrell Waltrip behind the safety car, his car undaunted, as is Buddy Baker in second place. Back in Martinsville, Virginia, with the Virginia 500, we're still under the first caution flag of the day. Just 500 feet from the opening green flag, they had a nine-car jam session down in turn number one. They've got the debris cleaned up, and Darrell Waltrip leads Buddy Baker, Benny Parsons in Chevrolets, Neil Bonnet in a Mercury, Bobby Allison's Ford, and the Chevy of Joe Milliken. The pace car stretches the field as Harold Kinder waits with the green flag. Waltrip tries to edge Buddy Baker to anticipate the start. There's the green, and Waltrip gets a good jump down the home straightaway. Baker in close pursuit. Parsons holds third as their single file into turn one. Leaders up out of turn number two. Meanwhile, back in the pack, Richard Petty soldiering along at 18th position ahead of Cale Yarbrough after those pit stops. Petty looks underneath point leader Dale Earnhardt. Now, Earnhardt is four or more laps down after the action. They move past Slick Johnson. Petty picking up the 17th spot and goes to work on hometowner Buddy Arrington. Cale Yarbrough in hot pursuit. He's following Petty all the way through that traffic. And Mike, it's tough for them to pass because they have to do it on the outside. Petty works the high side of the racetrack past Jimmy Means. Gets a little bit high on the racetrack. Loses about half a car length, but makes it up down the straightaway. Into turn three and around the Ford of Tommy Gale. As they struggle to climb back up through the field. Back up front, Waltrip continues to lead Buddy Baker. Baker, I imagine, just keeping an eye on him at this point, Ned. He seems to be content running in second place right now, not using too much brakes, and boy, that can be a problem here. On a super speedway, Baker's not content with second, but this racetrack is different. As Petty works by Ronnie Thomas and Bobby Waywack out of the fourth turn, Earnhardt still forging ahead, building a wake for them. His car is still running very good, even though he's several laps down. Waltrip right at the bottom of the racetrack, keeping the car down on the concrete, as are all of the front six automobiles. Of course, the low side of the track is the fast way around this half a mile speedway. Waltrip brings it right down to the curbing and the grass at turns one and two. Baker's never straying more than three feet behind him. Moving up on the Junior Miller car now as Petty, working along at about 15th position with Yarborough, Earnhardt takes the low side under Miller. Miller, a rookie driver, gave him a lesson here as he moves into the third turn. The high side is the slow side here as Petty works underneath Junior Miller, and they come up on a group of cars running double file. And here we are back to Gant's car. They're taking the oil cooler off of that car, still trying desperately to get him back in the race. That thing looks more like salvage one than it does a Grand National race car. 
Dent was in sixth place in the point standings going into this race, and they want to preserve that. There's the new oil cooler going on. Here. Richard Petty continues to move up. There's 11th place Cecil Gordon. As up front, the leaders are caught in heavy race traffic. Buck Simmons moved to the low side to allow leader Waldrop in second place. Buddy Baker passed him. You're always in traffic here, Ned, aren't you? Yes, you are. You go around this track in about 22 and a half seconds, so there's always traffic somewhere. Dale Earnhardt has moved up on Kyle Petty, third generation driver, as his father, Richard, looks for room underneath. Richard's father, Lee Petty, first one at this racetrack way back in 1953. Richard Petty, a 14-time winner here, is going to have to pass his son if he's going to get to victory lane today. Kyle holding that inside groove as he moves around the track, trying to give the others room to run, but he's running so well himself, it's tough to pass. Richard Petty looked to the inside. Kyle drops down, but Earnhardt shuts Richard off at the third turn. Richard Petty then moves up into the 10th position. As up front, Waltrip continues to lead Buddy Baker. And they're back to Harry Gant's car trying to get that oil cooler. And you can see the bracket that it bolts on is bent up so badly they can't get it back in its place. If that was your street car, it'd be about a three-week job in the body shop. They're trying to do it in 15 minutes. Richard Petty applies the chrome horn to Dale Earnhardt's car, nudging him a bit as he comes off the turn. And it is Petty up to the high side, overlapping Earnhardt. Kale Yarbrough just follows him right through in the fourth turn. Uh-oh, trouble at the other end of the racetrack. Kyle Petty has come unglued with Ronnie Thomas up at turns three and four. And, and their car has stalled in the middle of the racetrack, Mike. It's a miracle someone hasn't hit him. Kyle Petty's probably on the radio calling for road service as the field just streams by. Waltrip still the leader. Buddy Baker holding second. Of course, the caution flag is out during this period as Kyle Petty sits in the middle of the racetrack. Wonder what his thoughts are. Well, the record comes down to his rescue, but I'm sure that he was saying a prayer that when they were going around at full speed that no one hit him. Kyle Petty's car gets ungloriously pushed to pit road with a flat left front sneaker, and you see the red cross yellow flag out. That'll cost him a two lap penalty to change it and get back into action. Even so, though the flat came from the accident, still the penalty applies. So the caution is out for the second time this afternoon in Martinsville, and here's the Bob Johnson team. They are still going at it. Darrell Waltrip continues to trail the safety car. He's led every lap so far of this Virginia 500. Here you race not just the cars, but the racetrack as well. This racetrack has perhaps as many challenges and characteristics as any racetrack they run on. Besides the long straightaways and the short, narrow turns, they have four different racing surfaces to contend with. And then there's a curbing down on the inside. And they run close to the inside here. And if the tires hit that curbing, it can bounce them into another car. Now, the inside groove is actually cement. And they get good traction here with the left side tires. And then they move up into the second groove here, which is just regular asphalt that they run on, on most of the racetracks so they get good traction here too. But then if they get up in that third groove, you can see that it's very shiny and the race drivers call it bear grease. But what actually has been done, the, the track officials have put a sealer here to protect the asphalt. But it gets very slippery and you try not to get up into this area. But boy, if you get up into this fourth groove, this is the one that can be the end of the day for you. This is what the drivers call the marble area. There's rubber and other debris here. And if you get your right side tires in that, you're really into trouble then. Because if you hit this area, with your right side tires, it's going to scoot you right into this four-foot wall here, and when you hit that, that means the end of the day for you as far as Martinsville is concerned. Getting set to go racing once again in the $140,000 Virginia 500. The cars on the lead lap line up on the outside. Cars that are one or more laps down are on the inside row, like Tommy Gale's Ford. Up front ahead of James Hilton's bent and battered machine, Green flag is on for the restart. Walter wastes no time in jumping out ahead of Buddy Baker. Into turn one. Down against the concrete and the curbing. Waltrip takes the low line and swings up high, accelerating up to 130 miles an hour. There is Petty and Yarborough. Stuck midway through the field, still trying to gain lost ground from that opening lap's crash. Walter has about a three-car length separation, and there's Harry Gann. They did get that car back on the track. He's trying to get the feel of it right now, Mike, running slower than he normally would run. Looks more like a modified than a Grand National with no front sheet metal as Walter runs away and tries to hide. 
at the Virginia 500. Darrell Waltrip has led since the opening green flag, but his rear view mirror has been filled with Buddy Baker. In that silver and black Chevrolet, Baker's just kept hounding him since the start. He has made no moves to try to pass it, but keeping the pressure on. Coming up from the back of the pack after being involved in a first lap accident, there's Richard Petty on the outside, moving around DK Ulrich to take over the eighth position. Cale Yarbrough in hot pursuit now goes to the outside of Ulrich. Both drivers involved in that first lap action as Petty draws a bead on Dave Marcus for the seventh spot. A lot of sheet metal damage on Petty's car, but it is running like it would have had it been undated. Petty around the outside of Marcus, and that's the hard way to pass here. Yes, it is, Mike. The car has to be working perfectly to be able to do that, and Richard Petty has a unique style here at Marcusville. He sets the car up a lot softer as far as the springs are concerned than other drivers, and then he has to drive it very carefully going into the turns, but look at him as he pulls underneath Joe Milliken going into the turn. He gets that nose under there, then he gets good traction off of the turn and passes it down the straightaway. Well, Petty's a master at it here. He's won here 14 times, including last year's Virginia 500. Bouncing off the curbing as he comes up out of the turn. That's really the short way around. Yes, it is, but he held it. J.D. McDuffie, things have not gone his way today. He's out of the race. Well, the engine let go on his car. Waltrip continues to run away from the field. There's Bobby Allison, and Petty has now moved into a challenge for the fourth spot. And he's passing Allison on the outside. And that's not easy to do. Allison's Ford gives up a little in horsepower to the Chevrolet, but it will handle right on the bottom of the racetrack. And he goes right down to the inside. That's the groove that he wants to run, and Petty knows if he's going to get around him, he's going to have to do it on the outside, so he's working on it. Petty's got to protect his spot as well. Neil Bonnet right behind him rides in the sixth position in a Mercury. Heavy race traffic. Cecil Gordon inside, Richard Childress outside. As Waltrip breaks free of the traffic down the front straightaway, he's gained a little ground on second place Buddy Baker. Waltrip, the pole sitter, won three of the first four racers. And there's what pit sign, tires okay, that's being given to rookie Bill Ellswick. Little bump and bang as Bobby Allison and Richard Petty get to it. Down the back straightaway. Petty comes up along the outside. Allison has to keep his car right down to the curbing. Moving up on Richard Childress, Petty trying to box Allison in against the lap car. Does it. Petty on the outside uses Childress as a buffer zone. And here's Bonnet trying to drop kick Allison back to the fifth spot. Neil Bonnet will make it work on the outside, and Bobby Allison drops all the way back to sixth position. And now Bonnet has picked up on Petty, trying to keep up with him, and here's Harry Gant running at full speed, even though he's 61 laps behind. But chasing those important Grand National points has kept Gant in the race. Waltrip continues to extend his margin. Here's Petty and Neil Bonnet coming off high and hard. And Bonnet hits the wall as he comes off of the second turn. He just caught a piece of it and put a stripe in the white paint that surrounds the Martinsville Speedway, that four foot high, one foot thick concrete wall you spoke of. And he did some damage to that right rear quarter panel. Smoke coming from the right side of the car. Apparently the sheet metal is in against the tire. He'll have to make a pit stop. Oh, he's dropping off the pace. Tough break for Neil Bonnet. He loses the fifth spot as he heads the Mercury onto pit road. And the Wood Brothers from Stewart, Virginia go to work on that car. Of course, they'll have to change those right side tires, and let's see if they repair that sheet metal damage. So far, they're not working on that part. They're just changing the tires, maybe thinking they'd had a flat. Well, they could change those tires under green faster than the two laps they'd lose by having to do it under the caution and take the penalty. Petty was not involved, and he set sail on Benny Parsons, who was held down to third position ever since the green flag drop. And remember, not too long ago, Petty was in 18th position. Petty looks to the inside on Parsons, that catching up with a driver at Martinsville is one thing, but isn't passing him quite another? Yes, it is, because you don't have much room to do it. Parsons goes just a little bit high. That's all Petty needed to get on the inside of him, and he has the advantage. Parsons looked just a little bit loose coming off the turn, and there is Petty inside, stealing the fast groove from Benny Parsons, and Bobby Allison wastes no time in following Petty through. Parsons keeps Allison tight and will try to box him in behind the number 90 of Jody Ridley. Richard Petty really climbing up through is now moved into third position behind Waltrip and Buddy Baker. And here's rookie driver Bill Ellswick, car number 75, has spun it out. Mike, maybe he didn't heed that warning about his tires. Well, the caution flag will certainly make it interesting for Richard Petty and Cale Yarbrough, who've climbed through the field from 18th and 19th positions. 
We're under caution at the Virginia 500. Darrell Waltrip has led every lap. He has yet to make a pit stop. Richard Petty has, and he's gone a lap down in the process. There are six cars on the lead lap. Petty is one lap behind in seventh. And all of the top cars have made stops for gasoline, excepting Waltrip. Don't know what his strategy is. There's that cross flag. They stop now. They're penalized two laps if they change tires. Light is out on the safety car. That means the green flag is imminent. Waltrip starts to pull away. There's Petty moving up on the outside, and Waltrip dives onto pit road, and there's the safety car in his way. And he bumps the safety car, and Mikey is making a mistake coming down pit road now. They were told in the driver's meeting they would have to take the green flag on the racetrack. He came down pit road and got the green flag. There's Waltrip's crew and the NASCAR officials showing two fingers. That's two laps that Waltrip will have to sit on pit road. And that is in addition to the time that he's losing now changing tires. Well, they're going to take advantage of the situation to change all four tires. As we watch Buddy Baker, Cale Yarbrough, and Bobby Allison slug it out for the lead. Waltrip's pit stop was a break for Petty. With Waltrip on pit road, that puts Petty right ahead of the new leader, Buddy Baker. He's trying desperately to stay in front of Baker and stay in the lead lap. Baker, Yarborough, and Allison fighting for the Virginia 500. Here's Yarborough on the inside of Buddy Baker. Doesn't quite have the horsepower to dig out of the turn and get underneath Baker. And here's Waltrip sitting in the pits. Can't go. The official with his hand out holding him, penalizing those two laps. Baker crosses the stripe once again. And not yet. One more lap. He's got to sit on pit road. That must be frustrating. It is. Baker takes a little bit of a high line. Yarborough once again cannot get underneath. They're still holding Waltrip in the pits. One more lap to go. Buddy Parrott frustrated too. Well, Buddy Baker must see that as a good sign. He couldn't pass Waltrip in the first 180 laps of this race. And now they finally give Waltrip the signal that he can get back in racing, but Mikey is four laps down. Making up even one lap is a tough chore here at Martinsville. And here's the great debate between the crew members and the NASCAR officials. Buddy Baker now enjoys a four-lap cushion over Waltrip, but his pursuer becomes Cale Yarborough in the Chevrolet, Bobby Allison in the Ford. As Cale Yarborough's team watches his man lap this racetrack at around 90 miles an hour, Neil Bonnet drops the Mercury to the inside as a hard-charging Darrell Waltrip comes up the outside groove and sets sail on Benny Parsons. Waltrip trying to make up some of the time he lost in the pits. Four laps down, but he's giving it a run for the money. Trying to dive under Parsons at the south end of the speedway. He's got the racing room. And, and Mike, his car is working beautifully with those four new tires on it. Handling right at the bottom of the racetrack on the concrete. He muscles Parsons to the outside and gains back a bit of ground. Up front, Buddy Baker is the leader as Waltrip struggles to regain those four lost laps. Waltrip's handling well at the bottom of the racetrack, but is it handling? Horsepower or brakes that's the most important factor in winning here at Martinsville. Ned Jarrett took a look. Normally, when we think of race cars, we don't think of brakes because everything is geared to horsepower and going. But here at Martinsville, brakes are very important. The cars run about 130 miles an hour on the straightaway, then have to slow to 55 miles an hour in the turn. They do that twice each lap, which means they do it 1,000 times in 500 laps. They have to put coolers or a duck in to cool the brakes because they run about 22 seconds here and it puts so much heat on them. Now, when I was racing, they used a different kind of a brake. This is what was used. Heat about four to 500 degrees would literally crumple these up and then you were completely out of brakes. And sometimes that was within 15 or 20 laps. Now they have an advanced system. They have the disc brake system. And this is the pads that would go against the cylinder that actually slows the car down when it goes into the turn. And even as thick as this is, they will wear these brakes out in 500 laps and still have to be conservative to some degree. You'll see those brake ducts on the front of the car where the headlights ought to be, as these Grand National stockers bear only scant resemblance to the cars you drive on the street. And at 130 miles an hour on these straightaways, they are built for one purpose, and that's to get around this racetrack. As Baker laps his way around Dave Marcus, Cale Yarborough still sitting in. Bobby Allison is third, and here is Waltrip. He is still charging. Yes, he is, and using the inside of that racetrack, his car sticking perfectly down there, so he's able to pass them where he catches them. Well, he's on four fresh tires, and that will give him a bit of an advantage. Waltrip sandwiched in between the second and third place cars. 
Yarborough Chevrolet and Allison's Ford. He jumps to the bottom of the racetrack, but Kale cuts him off as they hit turn three. But Kale slips just a little bit, and that gives Walter the room he needed to move on the inside. James Hilton does a quick left turn to get out of the way as Yarborough and Waltrip bear down to the first turn. And Waltrip has the inside, and that's the fast way around. And look at the traction he gets coming off of that turn. New tires will do that for you as he sets sail on Buddy Baker. Waltrip of the 88 machine, four laps behind after leading the first 185 laps of this race. A miscue pulling onto pit road put him two laps down on the pit stop, plus a two-lap penalty, and he's trying to gain it all back. And he's moving in on Buddy Baker, and if he can get around him now, he will get one of those laps back. Baker driving the car number 28. Baker is the leader. Cale Yarbrough in number 11 is second. The 15 of Allison is third, and there is Waltrip drawing a bead on the leader. He is definitely the fastest car on the racetrack right now. Look at it, move to the inside without any problem whatsoever, moving around Baker, just making it look easy, Mike. Baker went into the turn hard and could not hold the bottom of the racetrack. And there is Waltrip moving up a notch. He's now only three laps down. Meanwhile, big battle for second spot. Inside is Bobby Allison, and he bangs Kale Yarbrough off the turn. And as they straighten out, Yarbrough gained, regains the second position. Moving up on a slow car, Yarborough boxes Allison behind James Hilton, whose car is still limping around after the first lap accident that took nine cars out of the race momentarily. Mike, it rained here this morning, and the air is getting very heavy again as Buddy Baker comes off with the fourth turn. He's giving a signal to the NASCAR officials that it's too wet. Well, these tires won't get any bite in the rain. They are slick, and oh, in tandem, Yarborough and Allison get loose coming off the turn. The caution flag is waving once again. And it has really begun to pour as a spring shower comes over Martinsville, Virginia. These cars don't have windshield wipers, Ned, but somebody's enjoying the rain. Well, maybe it's a day for the ducks. Rain has now covered the speedway. There's about an inch of water down at the track apron near the curbing as the fans run for shelter. They're a pretty hardy lot, though. They'll wait around and see if we can get this one back under green. And now hail has begun to fall as the red flag has finally come out. And that means the race cars will come to a complete halt here on the front straightaway. Well, they're short of the halfway point that would make the race official, and some of the crews are using the pit boards for other than to signal for shelter. So this race is far from over. They'll have to restart it to complete it officially. There's leader Buddy Baker. Well, it ain't over yet. Did you get back out there? Huh? Did you get back out there? Yeah, we'll get back up. It's not a race yet, anyhow. Baker is optimistic, and so are the 22,000 fans. The rain has stopped. And he's got a problem. Buddy Baker looking very dejectedly at his car and said, oh, why me? And he's got a flat tire. No wonder he looked that way, and he can't change that tire without losing two laps. What will Buddy Baker do? The rain has stopped at Martinsville, Virginia, and while we're waiting for the restart of the Virginia 500, Buddy Baker's car being uncovered. Let's take a look back to when Darrell Waltrip made his miscue that cost him four laps that he is desperately trying to regain. At the end of caution, Waltrip slammed onto pit road and it cost him dearly. Ned Jarrett is in the pits with Waltrip as we wait for this restart. Darrell, did you misunderstand the rule? I <laughs> will, I forgot what, uh, I just, I screwed up, you know. Uh... I, we stood in the truck and talked about it all more long. I was worried about everybody understanding it. I thought I understand it perfectly. I knew I had, I should have gone around one more time, but I just, it just, you know, I didn't, th wasn't thinking. The fans beginning to dry off. So are the race cars and the surface of this half mile speedway. 22,000 people here today. They want to see this race get back under green. The story of stock car racing is the story of the fans and their loyalties. As I found out this morning when I had a chance to get some of their feelings on this Virginia 500. Excuse me, who are you pulling for today? Uh, Bobby Allison. Why? Well, I just like a Ford. Who are you going to cheer for today? Richard Petty. How come? Because I want to, that's why. <laughs> well, why would you cheer for Richard and not Daryl or Neil or someone else? Because they're not good. I got to go with Dale Earnhardt. I don't know, it's probably one of my favorites right now. Well, why? I like to see the young boys run with them, you know what I mean? Dale, he's only been around two years or so. He's definitely running with him. So, race wouldn't be the same. You come every year and watch the same man win. 
Yeah, Are they the $18 seats? Okay, yeah, all right. You want two tickets? I want four. Why do you want to sit there? So I can watch Richard. <laughs> if he wasn't here, I wouldn't be here. Pick one. Well, it'd be kind of hard. I'm not too prejudiced, but Richard Petty's awful hard to beat up here. Line up included. There are some strong loyalties here today to drivers, to cars, and to this sport. As Buddy Baker rolls his Chevrolet around this half-mile racetrack, the rain has stopped and we're waiting for the restart. Here is Baker limping onto pit road with a flat right front sneaker. And Cale Yarborough now will take over the lead, but Baker will lose two laps by changing those tires under this caution period. Tough break for Buddy Baker. He's a perennial winner of the Headache Award on this circuit, and he may get another one today. Now remember, he'll lose two laps by changing tires under the caution. That's a new rule that went into effect for short tracks here today. And here he is limping into the pits. Waddell Wilson and the rest of the crew go to work. They're trying to get that right side up. And here is Joe Milliken and Dale Earnhardt in the pits also during this caution period. Milliken was among the front five, and that will put him two laps down. Here's Bobby Allison going on to pit road. Will he gamble and take tires and try to make up two laps? It will be interesting to see if Bud Moore and the crew know they're just looking at the tires. They're going to add gasoline and send him back on his way. So Allison will try to stretch out tire wear as the green flag drops on Cale Yarborough. Under the caution, Waltrip has moved around, and he's behind the leader, scrambling to get back another of his lost laps. And there's that bent and broken race car of hair again. He's kept up with the leaders after making lengthy repairs early. Still running very strong in that battered car. Walter tries to get around Cale Yarbrough to regain one of those laps he's down. The 11 of Yarbrough is the leader. Walter at 88, trying to dive underneath and recapture lost ground while that short track shortened up car of hair again manages to keep pace. Out of the turn, into the straightaway, and Walter has the move on the inside. He bobbles just a bit, but he stays even with Yarborough into the turn. That car is getting super traction down on the inside as he tries to pull away from Yarborough. Down the front straightaway, it's a good thing NASCAR does not allow door handles on these cars, so they would have knocked off a couple right there. As you can see at the close competition right here is the two rookies, Slick Johnson in number 53 and Jody Ridley car number 90 battle. Ridley is the leading rookie point leader on the circuit. Slick Johnson giving him a run for the money. They're working underneath Terry Labonte, and all those cars show some sheet metal damage. And the leader, Cale Yarborough, is coming into the pits. Junior Johnson's crew ready to go to work, and they're changing tires, and they're doing it under the green flag. Now, Mike, of course, there will be no penalty for doing it this way. But with the fast lap times they turn here at Martinsville, he will lose about a lap and a half to the new leader. That'll be Benny Parsons. But that's a good pit stop, about 14 seconds. Yarborough Chevrolet back onto the speedway as Richard Petty has scrambled back from an early pit stop under green. There's Bobby Allison in the four. Allison still up among the leaders, and oh, Allison goes sliding off the fourth turn and just rockets into that cement wall. And you can see who got the worst end of that deal. Bobby Allison's car lips down the front straightaway as the drivers race to the caution flag. We'll take another look at what put Allison slamming into that fourth turn wall when we come back. Let's take another look and see how Bobby Allison got into the concrete at turn four. That right front tire blows. You can see the right front of the car go down right there. He has no control over the car. Right into that wall, he goes at 90 miles an hour. Boy, these cars are built to take a beating. And that one just took quite a shot. Maybe Allison stayed out there too long on those more tires, Mike. Richard Petty ahead of Darrell Waltrip as we're back under green in the Virginia 500. Waltrip is just one lap down and he's struggling to get back on the lead lap. Petty in front holding off the young lion as they come down the front straightaway at 130 miles an hour. Jump on the brakes and dive into the turn. Waltrip getting a good bite on the inside of the racetrack, but he doesn't seem to be able to come out under Petty. And now, midway down the backstretch, he dives in and Petty slams the door. Petty used his experience and shut the door on him as he went into that turn, but here comes Waltrip trying again. Waltrip getting a jump off the corner. Underneath Petty, does he have the racing room? Petty dives to the left, can't hold him off. Waltrip has the room. Now, does he have the power in the backstretch? Cars pretty well evenly matched on the straightaway, Mike, but Waltrip maintaining that low groove. Now he moves on the inside again. Petty at 42 is the sport's all-time winner, and Waltrip is trying to teach him a thing or two about Martinsville. Staying glued together 
running, averaging 90 miles an hour, racing closer together than most people park. If this isn't the finest auto racing in the world, Ed, I don't know what is. Well, they say it 31 times a year, and here they are batting again off of the fourth turn. From short track to super speedway, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like the way they hammer on one another here at Martinsville. Inches apart. Again, they dive into the turn, and they stay two by two as if the two cars were welded together. Mike, you couldn't drive that close together on the freeway at 60 miles an hour. Walter passed the inside, and he should have the advantage, but Petty is keeping him way tight and trying to allow Darrell not to get a jump off the turn. And as they go into the turn this time, they bump, and that's going to break Petty loose just enough that he'll give Walter the advantage off the turn. You can bump and bang here at Martinsville, but Petty got caught in the wrong spot and got a little green and white on the flanks of his Chevrolet. And that has put Waltrip on a lap with the leaders in trouble. Down at turns one and two, Dick Brooks has planked his Chevrolet into the wall. And Brooks will exit the race while running in the top ten. Time running out of the Virginia 500. Green flag is on, and Waltrip is back in the lead lap. And here's Petty leading the pack, and he's fought his way back, too. Not as many laps down, of course, as Walter was at one time. Benny Parsons behind Petty, and Petty is signaling. Looks like he's headed for pit road. Yes, he is, and this would be an unscheduled pit stop, Mike, and he does bring that car down pit road. Richard Petty drops out of the lead. He had almost a lap to himself to bring the car in for service, and they're waltzing out of turn two. Tied together, as it were, were Cale Yarbrough and Benny Parsons, and there is Walter right with them. Parsons and Walter were fighting for the lead with Yarbrough about to go a lap down. He's trying to keep himself from getting lap back. Yarbrough in the blue and white 11 car just about to be lapped by the 88 of Walter for the 27 of Parsons as they fight for the lead. And here's Richard Petty getting back into action after making that pit stop. He's now running in third place. Darrell Walter up front with Benny Parsons. That's the battle for the lead, Cale Yarbrough, just ahead of Waltrip's 88 car, trying to keep from going a lap down. As Waltrip has put some separation on the second place runner, here you see Benny Parsons. Petty is third. Cale Yarbrough runs fourth as things start to string out of their trouble. As Slick Johnson, a rookie, spins it around on the grass. Just a few laps to go. Johnson gets his car in gear and back out onto the racetrack. Off the grass, kaplunk, off the curbing. That'll put debris on the racetrack, and caution is out once again. Along with the caution, there's the white flag. They will finish under caution. And from here, Darrell Waltrip could coast home to his third career victory at the tight, tough Martinsville Speedway. We'll be back with Ned Jarrett in victory lane in a moment. Darrell Waltrip has come incredibly from four laps behind to beat Benny Parsons, Richard Petty, and Cale Yarbrough to win $28,000 in today's Virginia 500. Let's go down to victory lane and Ned Jarrett. Well, Darrell is coming out of the car now as he comes out and waves to the crowd. And a big kiss to Stevie, his wife, as he comes out of the car. And boy, what a happy couple they are here right now. Darrell, congratulations. Oh, Ned. <laughs> Gee whiz, that was just... Uh... I got us in a bad situation, and I didn't know if I could get us out or not, but everybody did a hundred, gave 100%, and I uh, drove the car, and, and it handled good, it run good, and we're, we're here we are in Victory Circle. I just think it's, uh, it's an omen to President Carter and everybody else. Don't give up. Waltrip's winning average speed was slowed by eight caution flags for 94 laps to 69.121 miles per hour as he bested Benny Parsons, Richard Petty, Cale Yarborough, and Joe Milliken. Jody Ridley ended up the highest finishing rookie in the race, besting Slick Johnson for those honors. For Ned Jarrett, I'm Mike Joy, and that's the story of the Silver Anniversary Virginia 500.